And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but suffers the loss of his own soul? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. More than 200 years ago, St. Alphonsus de Liguori lay dying in the Redemptorist Monastery in Pagani in southern Italy. He was 90 years old, half blind, half deaf, bent over with rheumatics. And in his last days, he had a young nephew, a rather worldly young man of Naples, who came to visit him. And the young man asked his uncle, Surely, uncle, you have some last words for me. The old bishop looked at his young nephew and spoke three words. Simple words, but words which would go straight to that young man's heart, changing him from being a worldly young Catholic to one who is sincere in the practice of his Catholic faith. Those three words were these. Save your soul. And that is the same message that we come to bring to you during this parish mission this weekend. Save your soul, save your immortal soul, because this is the one and only reason why God has created. Right now, then, we're going to take a look at this all-important business of your eternal salvation in three points. Firstly, that God has created you to enjoy the unending happiness of heaven with him one day. Second, but that not everyone is saved. And third, that if you end up in hell, it will be your own fault. Let's start with our first point that God has created you to enjoy the happiness of heaven. If you open up your catechism, practically the first question in there is, why did God make you? And what's the answer? Well, Father, God made you to have fun. He made you to be rich and famous. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? God created you to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world so that one day you could be happy with him forever in heaven. And so you have not been created simply for the things of this world. It's fun, it's fame, it's fortune. No, God has created you for a far more noble purpose. And if you were to ask the damned souls in hell right now, what did they still possess of all the riches that they enjoyed while they were alive on earth? Do they still have their house? Do they still have their money, their sports car? What will they tell you? No, they said. Because we love riches more than we loved our God, all of this has been taken from us forever. You ask them, well, what about the honors that you enjoyed while you were alive on earth? Don't you have any of that fame where you are in hell now? And what will they tell you? No, they say, because we loved fame and honors more than we loved our God. This, too, has been taken from us forever. And you ask them finally, well, what about the pleasures that you enjoyed while during your life on earth? Don't you have any of that where you are in hell now? And what is their reply? No, they tell me, because we loved fun and pleasures more than we loved our creator. All of this has been stripped from us and forever. So you have not been created simply for the honors, pleasures, and riches of this world. No, you've been created by God for a far more noble purpose to enjoy the happiness of heaven with God one day. And you have only one chance to save your soul. You may know the story of St. Francis of Assisi. One day towards the end of his life, the saint was praying on Mount Alverno in Italy, when suddenly God raised up the saint in this ecstasy. And here is St. Francis of Assisi actually suspended in midair, levitating between heaven and earth. And St. Francis, he can look above him. And what does he see? He sees the gates of heaven open 
He sees the glory of God the Father. He sees Jesus Christ at his right hand. There is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and the saints. He can hear these beautiful harmonies in the celestial choir singing the praises of God. He can smell these beautiful odors walking down to him from heaven. And there are the angels beckoning to St. Francis to come up and inviting him to come up and enjoy their happiness with him. But remember, St. Francis is suspended in mid-air. So not only can he look above him into heaven, but he can also look below him into hell. And what does he see there? There, the jaws of hell are open, and he can look into this black abyss. He can hear the screams of the tortured damned, the blasphemies of the demons. He can smell the stench arising from the sulfur in the fire. And there is the long arm of the demon reaching out of the abyss, trying, if he can, to grab hold of St. Francis in order to drag him down into his own misery. Now, you and I in this life are rather like St. Francis of Assisi, as it were suspended between heaven and hell. God's doing everything he can to help you save your soul. But the devil's doing everything he can to drag you down into the abyss. And so, if you want to get to heaven, why you're here this evening. You've got to avoid sin, which is the only thing that can send you to hell. You may remember the story in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, of the twin brothers Esau and Jacob. They were the twin sons of this incredibly wealthy patriarch by today's standards. He'd be a multi billionaire. And Esau, being the older twin, was going to inherit everything from their father. Now one day, Esau comes home from hunting. That's what he is by trade. He's a hunter. And today, he hasn't got anything. That means he's hungry, he's starving, and therefore he's you know, really not to be made. And he bursts into the family tent, thinking we have help back in those days. And he says, Jacob, I'm starving. Give me some grub. And there's his twin brother stirring a pot of lentils over the fire. We can have kind of stoves in those days either. And Jacob sees his golden opportunity. Okay, Esau, Jacob says, let's make a deal. You've got something I want, death's inheritance. I've got something you want, these lentils, to keep you from starving to death. Are you willing to make the exchange? Esau realizes what his twin brother's doing. He's going to have to sacrifice this multi-billion dollar inheritance. And for what? Not even for steak and potatoes, but for some lousy lentils. And yet Esau rationalizes to himself, if I die of starvation, thanks to my brother here, he's still going to inherit everything anyway. So what have I got to lose? Okay, Jacob, Esau says, give me the grog. Now, when scripture tells us that when Esau had eaten the lentils, he roared aloud, realizing the stupidity of what he'd done. Now, from our halfway comfortable seats, we can sit back and say, if I had been in Esau's place, I wouldn't have made such a dumb mistake like that. Give up a multi-million dollar inheritance for some lousy lentils? No way. But consider. What does the sinner do when he commits a fully consented to mortal sin? He loses not just a multi-billion dollar inheritance, but an eternal inheritance of unending happiness and glory with God in heaven. In other words, the sinner, by committing deliberate mortal sin, is far more foolish than Esau ever was. But because of the weakness of our fallen human nature, it's so easy for us to take sin and stupidity for granted. Oh, Father, it's just a real sin. 
give up the television or my entertainment, how am I going to live? The rosary, 15 minutes every day. Oh my God, I'm dying. When we realize all that God has prepared for us one day in heaven, don't you think he deserves something a bit better from us? We need to remember that heaven is worth any sacrifice. You all know, I'm sure, the story of St. Thomas More. He was the Chancellor of England under Henry VIII. And because Thomas would not compromise his conscience, the king threw him into the prison there in the Tower of London, where the saint languished for many months. And one day, the saint's simple wife, Alice, came to visit him there in his prison cell. Oh, Thomas, Alice said, look, if you just tell the king what he wants to hear from you, you don't even have to believe what you're telling him. You just have to say it. Think of it, Thomas. The king will let you out of this prison. He'll let you come back home. And you're not such an old man yet, Thomas. You've got another 20 years of happy life with the family. Won't you do this for me? And St. Thomas More, he loved his wife, but he loved God more. And he said, Alice, think of what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to compromise my conscience, to commit a deliberate mortal sin. If I do what you ask, no doubt the king will let me out of his prison. He will let me go back home. But after having compromised my conscience and by offending my God so bravely, how do you suppose I can have one moment's peace of soul for the rest of my life? Those last 20 years of my life, Alice, would be nothing but spiritual pain. And then I die, and I go to my judgment, and I end up in hell because of this one mortal sin that I have deliberately committed. And hell is forever. Think of what you're asking me to do. Is it a fair exchange? I don't think so. And of course, St. Thomas More was right. Because heaven is worth any sacrifice. Paradise is worth any pain. Because God has not created you simply for the fun and fame and fortune of this life. No, he has created you one day to enjoy the unending happiness of heaven to come. That brings us to our second point, that not everyone will be saved. Now, for the last 60 years or so, or so we've all heard about universal salvation, how everyone's going to heaven except those nasty traditionalist Catholics. <laughs> And yet, we traditionalists, we have our own spin on universal salvation. It goes something like this. I'm a traditionalist, I'm a trap. I might be a radical traditionalist, a bad trap. I might even be a bad rat trap. That means that I've got a one-way ticket to heaven. So bad. But that's not the way that the saints looked at salvation. Consider, for example, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who would go around his monastery with his head in his hand and say, who knows whether I'm going to be saved or I'm going to be lost. And if the saints could say that about themselves, what about us? But Father, you'd say, surely, surely if we look into the Bible, the good book will tell us something that will make us feel good about ourselves. Okay, let's take a look into the Gospel. Firstly, the Gospel is according to St. Matthew, chapter 7, where Jesus tells us, Narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. Few. Next, to St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, where a young man comes up to Jesus and asks him, Lord, are there few who are going to be saved? Jesus, not wishing to discourage the young man, instead gives him practical advice. Strive to enter by the narrow gate, Jesus says, for many will not. Then we turn to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, where Jesus tells us many are called, but few are chosen. Few. So scripture itself 
convinces us that even among Catholics, not everyone is going to be saved. But Father, you say, what if I do lots of penance for my sins? Won't that guarantee me a place in heaven? And indeed, penance is very important. But St. Ambrose observes that it's easier to find one soul that has never offended God by a deliberate mortal sin than it is to find one soul that's actually done sufficient penance for that sin. But Father, you say, I go to confession regularly. Isn't that a guarantee of salvation? And again, frequent confession is very important. And yet, even among traditional Catholics, you will occasionally find those souls who make deliberately bad confessions. Either because they deliberately hide moral sins from the priest that they're too embarrassed to admit to, or because they don't have a true sorrow for having offended God, or they don't have a firm purpose to change their life for the future, or because they are unwilling to make up for grave sins against justice towards their neighbor, or even those who are unwilling to give up the unnecessary proximate occasions of mortal sin. For these persons, they are making bad, invalid, sacrilegious confessions. And instead of being stepping stones towards leading towards heaven, these bad confessions actually end up sending the soul deeper into the abyss of hell. But Father, you say, doesn't God love everyone? How can he be such a mean old nasty foe that will send so many souls to hell? Yes, of course we know that God loves everyone. We know that God loves you. There's no doubt about that. The question is, how much do you love God? Do you love God more than anything else? Or are you willing to sacrifice God and the state of his grace in order to indulge fun, fame, or fortune? But Father, you say, isn't God infinitely merciful? Yes, God is infinitely merciful, but he will not force his mercy on anyone. He will not force anyone into heaven. If someone chooses the things of this world over God, then not even God can save them. God will not save someone against their will. Everyone receives what they truly desire, either God or hell and the misery of their own Many souls then end up damning themselves. But this does not mean that heaven is empty. By no means. Indeed, St. John in the book of the Apocalypse said that one day he saw heaven open and he saw there this innumerable number of saved souls. So we may say that the number of souls in heaven is innumerable and the number of souls in hell is innumerable. It's just in different proportions. Well, Father, you might be thinking, right now, my chances of having up an hour are probably pretty high, so why should I even bother trying? I might as well live life with here below, with all the fun, for, for fame, and fortune, live like a pagan, and enjoy life, at least, before I end up in hell. Well, no, that's a typical temptation of the devil who tries to discourage us from doing the right thing. You remember in the Gospels, the time that the apostles come up to Jesus in despair, they say, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus tells them, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that brings us to our third point. If you end up in hell, it will be your own fault. Let's take a look at two truths. They're like the two sides of the same coin. You can't, you can't separate the one from the other. So here's the first truth. That God wants everyone to be saved. This is certain. God even tells us in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel that I do not desire the death of the sinner. He says, but that the, con con the sinner convert and, be and live. So start off first by thinking of everything that God has given to you to help you get to heaven. To each of you, God has given certain gifts of nature and of grace. 
gifts of nature. Each of you has certain talents. Perhaps you had you had a good Catholic education. Maybe you've got good health. Maybe you've got a good job, money in the bank, a nice house, a sports car, whatever. Why has God given you the good things of this world? It's precisely to help you get to heaven, to help you save your soul. But if we're really honest with ourselves, how often do we actually miss? abuse, waste these talents, these gifts that God gives us, and turn them to our own pride and damnation. This goes even for the supernatural gifts of God, what we call his graces. Each of you has, think of the, the gift of the Catholic faith that you receive, Catholic, your Catholic baptism. Ask yourself, how many sacraments have you received during your life? How many sermons have you listened to? And yet, oftentimes we will turn even these graces of God to our own ego, to our own pride. And instead of helping us on the way to heaven, they can even end up leading us downwards towards hell. But next, take a look at all that God himself has done and suffered so that you can be happy with him in heaven one day. You can think of our first father, Adam. After Adam had sinned, God could have said, well, if that's the way the human race is going to treat me, what do I care about them? Let them all go to hell. But no, precisely because God does want you to be happy in heaven within one day, he sent his own son into this world to redeem from death, hell, and sin. And when the second person of the Blessed Trinity descends from the glory of heaven down to this miserable earth, how did he redeem him? Was it by being rich and famous and having lots of fun? No, it was by suffering and dying for you. Go over those five sorrowful mysteries of the rosary in your mind and ask yourself, why does Jesus choose it? We say choose because he's God. He's in complete control of everything that happens to him during his life. Why does he choose to undergo the sorrowful agony in the Garden of Olives? Why does he want to have the flesh excoriated from his bones in the scourging of the pillar? Why does he choose to undergo this incredible indignity and humiliation of the crowning of thorns? Why does he want to carry this great load of the cross on his shoulder as he walks to the city of Jerusalem? And finally, why does he want to suffer and after three hours before finally dying in agony on the cross? Why does God choose to suffer and to be humiliated so much? Because it was fun? No. It's because he values your soul, your happiness. He was willing to do anything in order to pay the price for your sin. He was willing to suffer anything in order to reopen the gates of heaven, which had been shut because of the sin of Adam. He was willing to suffer and to be despised to any degree, to the very last degree, in order to prove his love for you. We do not have the right to doubt God's love for us. He has proven it beyond the shadow of any doubt. Indeed, God so loves the sinner and desires his happiness. It's like God goes to the very deep of hell, holding on to the sinner's hand all the way down there. God doesn't let go of the sinner. It's only at that moment of death when the sinner says, thanks God, no offense, and he struggles out of God's grasp, that God is forced involuntarily to let the sinner fall into the hell that he has chosen for himself. Did God choose that sinner to go to hell? No. The sinner chose hell for himself. God does want everyone to be saved then. That's our first truth. And our second truth is like it. That whoever is down is down through his own fault. Let's go down to hell together right now. 
that you realize that God gives sufficient grace to everyone to save his soul. So, you have a good imagination. Let's suppose that right here in the middle of our room, you know, there's a big mantle car. And under that mantle car, that's where hell is. So we're going to lift off the mantle cover and we're going to take a look into hell. Are you ready? Remember, it's going to be hot. So, flip over the mantle cover. Oh, Steven Smoke, come out. <laughs> Who are we going to pull out of hell first? Let's try a pagan, okay? Roll your sleeve. Okay, Mr. Pagan, what are you doing down there in hell? Is it God's fault you're in hell? What's Mr. Pagan going to tell you? No, he says, it's my own fault. Because even though I had never heard of Jesus Christ or his Catholic Church, still God had written upon my heart and my soul the natural law. And if only I had observed the natural law, and if only I had been sorry for having offended my Creator, I could now be in heaven. It's my own fault I'm damned. So you see, not even Mr. Pagan can blame God for his damnation. It's his own fault. Going back down. Who are we going to pull out of hell next? Let's try a Protestant. <laughs> Lucky dip. Okay, Mr. Protestant, what are you doing down there in hell? Surely you believed in the Blessed Trinity. You knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. You had the Bible and the Ten Commandments. So what are you doing down there in hell? Is it God's fault you're down there? What's Mr. Protestant going to tell you? No, he says, it's my own fault. Because even though I did believe in the Blessed Trinity, even though I knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, even though I had the Bible and the Ten Commandments, still I was unwilling to do everything that Jesus taught me in the Gospel. And because I was unwilling to submit to the, the authority of the Sovereign Pontiff, it's my own fault I'm down. So you see, not even Mr. Protestant can blame God for his damnation. It's his own fault. Or oh, I'm back in. Yeah. Now, if the very pagans have no excuse for their damnation, what about us Catholics? Hey, hey, wait a minute. Hey, you know what? We haven't seen any Catholics in hell yet. Hey, maybe there aren't any Catholics in hell after all. Hey! Are there any Catholics down there in hell? <laughs> yeah, they're way down at the bottom. It's true. Because as Catholics, you and I, we've received bigger graces from God than anyone else. God has given to you and to me his own truth. We know the true faith. He has given us his own son to be our food in Holy Communion in the Eucharist. He has given us his mother to be our mother and advocate to him. Oh yes, if you or I end up in hell, we're going to be way down at the bottom. And so to you, Jesus says, stop for a moment in your busy life during this weekend of our parish mission. Look above you and see the heaven that you have been created for. Look below you and see the hell that you must avoid. Look before you and see Jesus on the cross. He has already suffered for your sins. He has already paid the price for your sins. We, can, we do not have the right to doubt God's love for us. He has already proven it beyond the shadow of any doubt. We've seen these three points. That God has created you to enjoy the happiness of heaven with him one day. But that not everyone will be saved. That if you end up in hell, it will be your own fault. So what do you have to do to avoid hell and to get to heaven? 
the first thing you need to do is to know how to make a good confession of your sins. And that's what we'll be looking at in our next sermon directly after Mass. During this parish mission day, God is offering you his forgiveness and his mercy. Take advantage then of the extraordinary grace that God wants to give you during these spiritual exercises. Because if everyone here in our chapel makes a good general confession of their life, then we may hope that one day everyone here will be saved. Let's ask God to grant us this grace through the immaculate hands of Mary, his mother, and ours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.